discuss climate change, its expected impacts, its solutions, the many constraints there are to making changes to our lives and persuading others to, and crucially what our cultural heritage in Scotland has to teach us about inspiring and motivating people to do what's required to combat climate change. Now you're joining us, uh, as I need to remind you, when the world is in the grip of a pandemic and normal life in Scotland and everywhere is in the process of being suspended. The effect of the coronavirus outbreak on the climate change debate and indeed on climate change itself is something we'll doubtless come on to think about. Do, uh, and they say, pop any questions you have um, as you listen to our speakers in the course of the next hour or so them down and we'll try and deal with them as we can. To the matter in hand, well, I think it's fair to say that here in Scotland, where the Scottish Government last year declared a climate emergency, the job may not be so much about convincing people of the science and the reality, but inspiring and informing people about what as individuals they can and should be doing and dealing with some of the, the contradictions and complexities that often paralyze us into inaction. To give us their insights and arguments, I'm joined this evening by a stellar cast of panelists. Let me uh, introduce them to you now. Professor Catherine Hayhoe, an atmospheric scientist and professor of political science at Texas Tech University, where she's director of the Climate Science Center. Catherine is going to be giving our keynote address tonight. Dr. Matt Winning, an environmental economist and a comedian who brings both parts of his life together with a special line in live climate change comedy. Sarah Crofts, Chief Executive of ICON, the Institute of Conservation, which raises awareness of the cultural, social and economic value of caring for heritage. Before that, she was with the Heritage Lottery Fund. And last but not least, Ewan Hislop, Head of Technical Research and Science at Historic Environment Scotland. So let me start by asking Catherine to take the floor for her keynote address. When I was asked, almost two years ago now, to give a TED Talk, I said that I would like to give a TED Talk on the single most important thing that any one individual can do about climate change. And it's true, when you look at TED Talks, there are already TED Talks on light bulbs and plant-based diets and electric vehicles. But in my opinion, the most important thing that any single individual can do about climate change is to talk about it. And that's what I ended up doing my TED Talk on. Um, why is this the most important thing? Well, when you look at survey results, you can see, and I'll show you this across the United States, but then I'll show you something for the UK as well. You can see that the vast majority of people would agree that yes, global warming is happening. Anywhere that is orange is more than 50% of people would say yes, and the darker orange the color, the more people would say yes. Would it harm plants and animals? The vast majority of people would say yes, it is happening and it will harm plants and animals. Will it harm future generations? Future generations also, people agree. Will it harm people in developing countries? Well, a little bit of blue here, but it's still mostly orange. So people agree that it's real, it affects plants and animals, future generations, people in developing countries. Then, will it affect us in the United States? We start to see more blue. People aren't sure that it matters to us. And then they ask the real question, will climate change affect you? It is almost dark blue across the whole map. But there's one more map that is even darker blue. But first of all, let me go to the UK. And in the UK, we don't have the maps, but we do have data across the whole country. And what we see is the vast majority, 90%, more than in the US, would say it's happening. But less than half would say humans are responsible. And when you start asking, are you concerned about it, we're down to a third, which are nearly the identical numbers as the United States. But there's one bluer map, and that is this one. Do you ever talk about it? As you can see, even in places where people are absolutely convinced that it is real and it is humans and it matters to the future, 
we don't talk about it. And let me connect the dots. If we don't talk about it, why would we care? And if we don't care, why would we act? Now, often people may say, well, I don't want to talk about it because I'm afraid it might look like this. Or we might end up just being depressed. But there is a way to talk about it that is constructive. And it begins by tackling the real problems. The real problems we have when it comes to climate change is not a matter of more education or more science. It's the fact that our opinions about climate change run along one single line and that is political affiliation. We feel a distance from the issue, that it matters to future generations, plants and animals, people far away, but not us. And we feel that the solutions are too difficult, too painful, or not enough. So let's look at these three problems first. The first one is that I have to be a certain type of person to care about climate change, and I'm not. Specifically, politically. This is the results of a new survey that came out in the US just in February, and they rank all of the issues and look at how far apart people are. Now red here, of course, is conservative, and blue here is liberal, and the further apart the dots here, the more Republicans and Democrats or conservatives and liberals differ on a given issue. Down at the bottom, we have issues that they agree on, like jobs and the economy, and up top, we have two issues that they most disagree on, more than issues like guns or the death penalty or military or immigration. Those two issues are climate change and environmental protection. Now you may say, yes, but that's North America. Well, I conduct my own surveys on social media. And before I have to block anyone for attacking me for being a climate scientist, I look at their profile. And if they are in the US, they are typically affiliated with the right-hand side of the political spectrum. They might have MAGA in their profile. If they're from Canada, they hate the Prime Minister. If they're from Australia, they love the Prime Minister. And if they're from the UK, their social media profiles look like this. Nearly every single one has Brexit in it. But the reality is, to care about climate change, all we have to be is a human living on planet Earth. We were not ever meant to be floating around in outer space without the resources that this Earth or planet provides. We cannot survive without everything that we have, the air that you breathe right now, the water we drink, the food we eat, the materials we use for everything come from this planet. So the truth is, to care about a changing climate, we only have to be one thing, and all of us are that one thing. That's a human living on planet Earth. The second most dangerous myth we bought into is the idea, again, that there's distance between us and this issue. Distance in time, it matters in the future but not now. Distance in space, it matters to people or places or animals or plants who live far away. And even distance in terms of what's relevant to us. It matters to somebody who is a, a tree hugger but not to me because I'm not. Remember this map I just showed you. This is the number of people who think that it will harm plants and animals, and then the next map, the number of people who think it will harm them personally. This is what psychological distance looks like. But of course, we know that there is no distance anymore between climate impacts and ourselves. Climate change is increasing the amount of rain that the United Kingdom receives in winter and increasing the amount of heavy precipitation like was experienced just this past February, which was the wettest on record for many places across Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. We know already that extreme rainfall is much more intense. Four of the top 10 wettest winters have occurred since 2007, seven out of the top 10 since 1990. The amount of rainfall in the wettest days has increased by almost 20%. And, of course, it's not just about the rain coming down from the sky, we also have sea level rise too. As the ice sheets melt, as oceans warm and expand, we are concerned about what is happening even right here where we stand today. Maps showing our disappearing coastlines as the seas rise. Two thirds of the world's biggest cities are located within just a meter of sea level. Hundreds of millions of people could be put at risk as our seas rise. And then there's the heat and our summer droughts as well. We know, for example, just last summer there were hundreds of high temperature records broken across Europe. And we know 
that Europe has experienced five 500-year summers in just five, 15 years. It's not a 500-year summer if you have five of them in 15 years. How is this happening? Climate change is loading the weather dice against us. We always have a chance of rolling a double six, a heavy rain event, a record-breaking flood, a heat wave, a storm. But as the planet warms decade by decade, it's sneaking in and taking another one of those numbers on our dice and turning it into a six or even a seven. We're seeing the area burned by wildfire around the world, including even in the United Kingdom and Ireland and Europe increasing. Alaska had its worst wildfire season on record just last summer. The Fort McMurray wildfires in my home country of Canada were the most expensive insured disaster in our history. And of course, the headlines have been dominated in recent months by the Australian wildfires. Today, no matter where we live, we are seeing the impacts of climate change right here. The reason we care about it is because it is a threat multiplier. It is taking the issues we already care about and exacerbating them or making them worse. Venice has always flooded, but today Venice is flooding up to 10 times more frequently than it did just 100 years ago, with depths of meters rather than feet. We know that many historical sites are located in coastal areas where they're at risk from sea level rise, whether it's historical temples in Hawaii, whether it's um, forts in South America or in Florida, whether it's the infrastructure even that we have on our islands. Sea level rise puts us all at risk, and that is one of the main reasons why many historic monuments and many historic buildings are also at risk, from UNESCO World Heritage Sites to our own local events. The truth is that climate change is already affecting us, here and now. And at my university, one of my colleagues actually studies this. He's found, very interestingly, that when we bring the impacts of climate change home, we talk about what's happening in Edinburgh versus Glasgow. We talk about what's happening to historical sites that we visit that we're familiar with. We talk about how our health is being affected, or our food, or things that we care about. The security of our home, our children's school, the places where we go, how they're changing. He found that it actually brings it much closer and it decreases the political polarization as well. So by bringing the impacts home and connecting the dots between how climate change affects something we already care about and why we would care about that, by doing that, by connecting those dots, we are not only decreasing the psychological distance, we are actually also decreasing the polarization. Then we're on to the third most dangerous myth, that the only viable solutions are bad, they are harmful, they will decrease the quality of our life, or they may not be sufficient. Now, of course, we're not talking about pulling the plug on everything tomorrow. Neither are we talking about returning to the Stone Ages. If you're interested in doing that, I believe there are some television shows where you can do that. <laughs> also some, some cookbooks too. But what we're talking about specifically is the fact that one out of every six deaths around the world is due to pollution. And the greatest source, not the sole source, but the greatest source of our air, water, and soil pollution is fossil fuels. The International Monetary Fund tells us that fossil fuels are currently subsidized the amount of 6% of the world's GDP. And these are some of the richest corporations in the world. If we look at a list of the 10 richest corporations in the world, at the top we have Walmart, and then we have oil and gas, oil and gas, oil and gas, automotive, automotive, electric, oil and gas. The truth is that fossil fuel use is expensive and it is harmful. And there are positive beneficial solutions from across the political spectrum. And right here in Scotland, there are many examples of that. Scotland is now well over 70% of its electricity from renewable sources, aiming for 100% within a very short time. Yes, much of that is the low-hanging fruit, but it's also significant progress towards a zero-carbon country. This is one of my favorite cartoons. You may have seen this one before. What if this whole thing is a big hoax and we just create a better world for nothing? What are the terrible consequences of that? of clean air and clean water, of jobs, of renewable energy and livable cities and sustainable economies. 
The reality is, is that there are many solutions to climate change that benefit us now as well as in the future. So that's why it's so important to talk about it. And when we talk about it, we directly address these three problems. We address the identity politics that I know I'm for Brexit and you're not, so we, we, we must differ about climate change. We address this by bonding over something that we genuinely share. Then we address the psychological distance by connecting the dots between what we care about and how climate change is affecting it. And then we have to talk about positive, beneficial, meaningful solutions to overcome both the solution aversion on one side, the people who say, oh, it's too difficult, we can't do it, as well as the despair on the other side, people who say it's too difficult, it's never enough. So what does this look like? Here's a few examples. We don't do so again by starting with what we disagree on. We don't want that conversation. If we're beginning with what we disagree on, stop the conversation right there. We want to begin the conversation instead, first of all, by bonding over shared values. What is something that we genuinely care about that the person that we're talking with does too? Second, connect the dots between that thing that we both care about and how climate change is affecting it. And then third, we can inspire each other with positive, practical solutions that we can engage in, that other people are engaging in, spreading the good news and the hope that yes, if working together, we really can fix this. So people often ask, well, what type of things could I bond over? And there's really a huge range of things. So obviously we can bond over the place where we live, uh, our family, a shared faith, an activity that we enjoy, um, experience in the military or a club or a business. I've bonded with people over things as simple as knitting or cooking, the food that we eat, uh, the place that we're from, something that we both enjoy doing. I've talked to people connecting the dots if they're part of the Rotary Club or if they're part of a faith tradition where as almost every major faith tradition in the world says, we're to be good stewards of this planet that we've been given and to care for those who are less fortunate than us. There are so many ways that we can connect from the simple values of being a parent and caring for our children to being somebody who enjoys fishing, for example, and cares about the health of the animals and the fish in our ecosystems. You might say, but talking doesn't sound like much. Does it really make a difference? And I'm happy to say that based on actual research, and I have this slide here so you can see it is actual research, it does make a difference. Here's what this paper found. It turns out that when we talk about climate change with family or friends, it leads people to learn important information. The more we know, the more concerned we are, naturally, and the more concerned we are, the more we talk about it. So it actually initiates a true positive feedback effect. That's what talking about it does. What I found even more hearteningly is that science has also found that children can do it effectively. A study where they tested parents' opinions about climate change and then they educated the children found among middle school children, and this was done in a very conservative state in the US, they found that parents whose children were educated about climate change exhibited a higher level of concern afterwards. And in fact, these effects were strongest among the more conservative parents, and I love this, the daughters were especially effective at influencing their conservative dads. But then people might say, okay, that's fine, but still, I'm not the best messenger to talk about climate change. In the US, they have a guy who is called Bill Nye, the science guy. And Bill Nye will talk about science with one person, he will talk about climate change with two people. He will talk about climate change with four or five people. Bill and I will talk about climate change anytime. So people might say, well, isn't he just the best person to talk about climate change? It turns out that celebrities are number 10 on the list of the top 10 best people to talk about climate change. Number 10 being the bottom, not the top. Celebrities are not the best people to talk about climate change, though it's certainly good when they do. How about politicians? Nope, they're number nine. How about the Pope and religious leaders? Number seven. How about military leaders or business leaders? Number five. You might start to wonder who's at the top of this list. 
Well, scientists, it turns out, are the second best. Scientists are number two. Four out of five people trust scientists for information on climate change, but scientists can be polarizing, as witnessed by my experiments with my social media. So now you're probably wondering, well, who is number one? You'll never guess. The answer is you. Yes, the social science shows that friends and family are the number one most effective messenger about climate change. Why? Because we trust people who share our values and share our common language. And the more we trust the person we're talking with, the more accepting we are of what they say and the more concerned we are because if we both care about the same things and they're concerned, then I would be concerned too. So what do we talk about then? Don't worry, you don't have to be a scientist. Talk about what you do, whether it's what you eat, what you've done in your house, how you get around. We can also talk about the good news we see places like even where I live in Texas. And if it's happening in Texas, you know it's got to be happening everywhere. I live in Texas where uh, our solar production is doubling every year. We already have more wind production than any other state in the country. And we have the biggest army base in the U.S. and it's been powered by wind and solar energy for two years. I love this headline here, the Kentucky Coal Museum goes solar. United Airlines is flying carbon neutral biofuel flights out of the LA airport already. I love hearing about what congregations and churches, Catholic, Protestant, evangelical and more, are doing with clean energy, offering their roofs up as community gardens to grow solar energy. I like talking about what some companies are doing. Walmart is the richest company in the world, but they're planning to be 25% clean, or sorry, half 50% clean energy by 2025. Apple's number 11, but they're already 100% clean energy, and Microsoft is catching up. They announced recently, Microsoft, that not only will they be carbon neutral, they plan to suck the carbon out of the air that they produce since the 1970s. I like talking about what countries are doing. We have a price on carbon in Canada. Ireland's divesting from fossil fuels, and of course, Scotland is one of the leading countries in the world for decarbonizing its electricity sector. Morocco has the biggest solar farm in the world. The UK, of course, has the biggest offshore wind farm in the world. And China has more wind and solar energy than any country in the world. These are the things that we can talk about, that bring us together, that give us hope, that make us feel like, yes, there are solutions. We are not the only person with our hands on a giant boulder trying to push it up the hill. In fact, there are already millions of hands on that boulder. It is already starting to roll very slowly, very gradually, but it is already starting to roll down the hill. We just need more hands pushing it to go faster. I love talking about new technology that's being implemented around the world in places where they don't have abundant sources of fossil fuels but they have lots of wind and lots of sun and much great potential for smart agriculture, carbon farming, and many other amazing solutions. But the bottom line is this, when we use our voices to talk about climate change, to advocate for change at every level, in our school, in our family, in our community, in our place of work, in our city, in our town, in our county, in our country, Using our voice to advocate for change is the single most important thing that any one of us can do. How? We can effectively talk about it by bonding first. Step number one, bond over shared values. Step number two, connect the dots to how climate change is affecting what we care about and what do we care about more and what brings us together more often than our heritage. And last of all, inspiring with positive, beneficial solutions. Because when it all comes down to it, you are the best person to talk about climate change. Thank you. I am a scientist. Uh, I work at the UCL, uh, University College of London uh, Institute for Sustainable Resources. Um, and I uh, did my PhD before that in Scotland at the University of Strathclyde uh, on uh, climate change policy. And I, uh, at the same time when I started my PhD, started doing comedy as well. 
uh, as a way to basically, I think, to stop thinking about climate change on a daily basis, uh, and as a way of getting out of the house uh, in the evening. And um, I basically spent, uh, spent about eight years doing those two things entirely separately. Um, you know, in the day sitting and thinking about the world's largest existential crisis, and then in the evening going out and trying to, like, have some fun, <laughs> entertain people. <laughs> Very sort of, uh, yeah, conflicting things. And then about three years ago, I decided to bring those two things together uh, to see whether it was possible to actually talk about climate change using comedy. And I think it speaks very much to the number one point which you said, which is that it's you talking about it is the most important thing. And a lot of people, I think, go to see comedians to uh, hear them talking about their lives, their experiences, and that's kind of what I try to do with climate change as well. Um, you know, as a comedian, you try to talk about sort of observational things that connect all of us together, and I'm trying to talk about the things about climate change that connect everything together. Um, very briefly, I'm going to do uh, a couple of jokes. Uh, let's see what happens, and then I'll just talk about uh, the benefit of that. Uh, I'm a comedian, uh, but uh, just to give you an idea of the sort of comedian that I am, uh, I am a sort of comedian that's followed on Twitter by the European Corrugated Board Industry. <laughs> Cardboard, that is my target demographic. Uh, from a comedy audience. Worst part about it, they've got 2,000 more followers than I do on Twitter. Um, and when I found that out, I wanted to walk directly into the sea, uh, <laughs> which will become increasingly easy over the coming decades. Um, so there you go. Um, if we can skip to the next slide, that would be super. Um, and I think we have uh, three main questions that we need to answer if we want to solve the climate crisis. And they just happen to be the same three questions you will be asked at any job interview for a bureau de change. <laughs> Must we change? <laughs> Can we change? <laughs> and will we change? <laughs> and that's what we're asking. Climate change. I don't know, maybe that's what we're going to start calling it. <laughs> okay, uh, the warmest year on record, I like to tell people 2016 2016. That is also my. PIN number, <laughs> always change it to the warmest year on record, um, you know, uh, it doesn't make me more susceptible to fraud, absolutely, but the message is getting out there, and that is the important thing. Um, and uh, most of that increase in temperature has come from our burning of fossil fuels, um, such as coal, gas and oil, which was the original name of the band Earth, Wind and Fire. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if you guys know that. Uh, but yeah, that's basically who caused, caused it. And um, what the impacts of climate change are going to be? Well, I think you can all see from this slide that I'm showing just now that the planet is going to get squashed and go sort of weird <laughs> colours. Um, and there's going to be six of them. So uh, <laughs> take your pick. Um, no, uh, changes in surface temperature, <laughs> precipitation, sea level rises. Um, now, as uh, Catherine was talking about, there's a lot of stuff going on in Scotland, especially it's been really great. In Scotland this year, in the first half of the year, we powered enough from wind to power two Scotlands, and nobody needs two Scotlands. <laughs> um, I mean, what are we going to do? Not? Yeah, well, I don't, I, I don't, I, is one like the good Scotland we put out and we've got guests coming around? I don't know. <laughs> also, is, as a unit of measurement, I'm not entirely sure that's going to catch on. You know, light bulbs, oh, that's a millionth of a Scotland, I don't know. Um, but there's been a lot of good news this year, especially um, the UK uh, and, and Scotland. Uh, well, the UK is going to go net zero by 2050. Scotland are going to do it by 2045, because if there's one thing that Scotland would like to do, it's to get it right up the English. Um, and if petty rivalry solves climate change, I am 100% <laughs> fine with that. In fact, if you skip to the next slide, Glasgow and Edinburgh are competing to become the UK's first ever net zero city. And it's going to be the biggest East Coast versus West Coast rivalry since gangster rap. There's going to be drive-bys and electric cars. And I'm pretty sure it's Edinburgh City Council that keep burning down Glasgow School of Art. Okay, so there you go, there's some slides for you, some jokes um, <laughs> about So, hopefully, it um, gives you a little sense, an indication of what I do. Uh, we can probably just switch off the slides just now, come to me. Um, I think there's two reasons why uh, talking uh, about climate change using comedy has been really effective. First of all, I find that it's a really good, well, the two things are, first of all, it reaches new audiences, uh, it's a really good way of communicating with people, and secondly, I think it helps us cope. 
uh, with climate change. And the first one I think is really important, and I, I've got a lot of um, experience from doing these shows. I've done three different shows, hour-long shows, about climate change over the last three years. I'm taking on a tour this year. I'm writing a book about it as well. And I think it's just a way of, well, first of all, as a messenger, I think uh, Catherine talks about a lot about, about how the messenger is important. Comedy is a really good way of uh, getting people to trust you. Um, as a messenger, it's, you're very uh, self-deprecating. You can put yourself on the same uh, level as other people. Um, there's an element of, I think, with a lot of climate change communication, with uh, it, it feels like you're being preached at uh, from, from someone that's uh, above you, and I think uh, comedy sort of uh, levels that out as well. It is quite politically neutral. I try to make fun of sort of all sort of aspects of it and I think that's quite beneficial um, and it makes you much more approachable as a normal person essentially to talk about it. And there's been a lot of benefits that I've found about doing it in terms of just the communication aspect. First of all, I think people uh, listen more when you're being funny um, and I think there's actually science out there showing that that is the case. People tend to be paying attention a lot more because they're enjoying themselves and if people are enjoying themselves they tend to actually uh, grasp onto certain facts and I'll try to put in a few facts during a show over the course of an hour I'll try and just get maybe like three specific facts that I would like people to actually take away and remember uh, but the rest of the time they're pretty much just uh, enjoying themselves. Uh, a few other points I think that are useful is that yeah it makes you, it, when you talk about it using comedy it, it, it relates to their life and I didn't really have much of a chance. Basically I mean what I did for, for I don't know a couple of minutes there if you imagine that but going on for an hour with a, a narrative and a lot more about my personal life and what I'm doing about climate change in it as well. And I think that helps because, it, it, you know, I talk about food and what I eat and I talk about travel and the impact that doing stuff about climate change makes on my life and people around me. And I think that's the way that people access this because you're talking about normal, everyday things that people um, all experience, experiences that we all have. And that's how to start talking about this. Um, and also I think it's a good way of showing that you can uh, change people's minds. And I don't mean people who don't believe that climate change is happening, I just mean showing people that climate change can be funny is, is, is a really interesting thing. I, I, I think people, I, I, I literally see people changing their minds in front of me before uh, I come on stage, people saying, oh, I don't you see how you're going to do this, I don't see how you can make this funny. And then after 10, 20 minutes or whatever, you can see uh, uh, as they start laughing and getting into it, you can see people's minds being changed and they become more open to that. And I think that's something that kind of, uh, comedy can, can, can do uh, to people and it starts conversations. And I've had so many more conversations doing comedy uh, about this than I have uh, as an academic by, by far because people come and talk to me and ask me questions and engage and I've had people change, tell me about the things that they've started doing after coming to see my shows. I've had people tell me they've changed their cars, sold their cars, and changed their cars, changed their energy provider, they've uh, told me they uh, changed their In fact, I had a, a, a letter from a, a Scottish family who um, not only did they uh, change their travel plans for the year, they also bought me some new socks. Um, I don't know if you've seen these. Uh, I don't know if you can get them on camera. <laughs> I, um, they came and saw me doing a show, and it just so happened the day that they saw me performing, uh, it was very wet, it was in Edinburgh, and uh, I performed without any shoes on, and I had holes in my socks. So they bought me some new socks, so that was nice. Anyway, um, <laughs> off on a tangent. Uh, but yeah, anyway, my point is, I think that uh, it's a really good way of engaging people and starting conversations with it. And especially in the last year, I've found that the number of uh, families who started coming to my shows um, was great because and, and you could see different generations coming to the shows and then talking about it afterwards and wanting to talk about what their family did, how involved their child was. I had people, uh, younger people especially as well, asking me what they can do with their life. Essentially saying, what, can I, what should I do with my life? because I care about this issue and I, I don't know what to do and I, I, I've been trying to tell people that you know you just you need to find what you're good at and, and see how you can match up with the area that you can have the biggest impact it's, it's interesting um, I think and I think comedy uh, and, and performing has a, has a, has a way of um, engaging with people in, a, in, in, in their everyday lives and, in a, and I think a lot of other performance as well can be quite difficult uh, to talk about climate change because it is such a heavy subject already so if you go and watch a really depressing play about climate change 
there's no release of tension there. And I think comedy is all about a release of tension. And so much of climate change is a build-up of tension, a build-up of we're worried about stuff. And there isn't a lot of release. Um, and I feel like from performing myself, I get a lot of release from doing it. And I feel like the people that come to the shows um, that already are involved in this area, that already care about it, it's a good way of them to try to cope with it because there is a release of tension. You can come in a room and you can share your worries and fears but laugh about it um, because otherwise there is no really outlet for, for caring about it. Um, so those are the main things that I wanted to talk about. Um, thanks very much and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the panel. Thank you. One very important question. Why did you not follow back the corrugated board people? <laughs> <laughs> There's normally a joke about that as well. Okay. I do normally say, I don't follow them back, so who's the real winner here? Oh, true. Nobody. Okay. Okay. Um, and as a small yeah, public no, service, I do think you just need to lift up your leg and let us see oh, so oh, yes. you in place. I'm properly very. I've yeah. got this ah. green, there's orange, there's red, and they send me like a five pack. So you can measure how many centimetres of sea level we're <laughs> <laughs> Now I want to turn to our uh, two other members of the panel because they are bringing a very um, crucial perspective to this debate, which is, is the role of, of cultural heritage. Um, Sarah, what role um, do you feel it, it does play or indeed could play in, in helping us to adapt to, to climate change? Well, I should start by saying that I come from a small heritage organisation, so uh, our, our mission is all to do with helping people care for objects. And if I look at my um, strategy, if I look at my uh, charitable objects, there's nothing in there about climate change or environment. And so I, I think I probably represent the kind of organisation that's trying to figure out how we engage with that debate uh, and where we uh, take some action, where we maybe show leadership. So for me, actually, the big issue is, is not so much about heritage, cultural heritage being somehow different and other in this conversation. It's about how it's part and parcel of what we do. And we actually don't have to look that far to find something that we can hang that on to. Um, without going into a short history of the entire conservation movement, that's for another panel. Um, if we go back to the beginning, there's a chap from John Ruskin, who's the sort of father of, of conservation. And actually, if you look at what he says, thinking about the built environment, he actually uses a phrase um, that's, uh, I'll just go check my notes. The earth belongs as much to those who come after us. Now, if that's not sustainability, I don't know what is. So actually, we've got that peg to hang what we're talking about on. And I think perhaps sort of reconnecting with that and just reframing it so that we can bring climate into the cultural heritage debate probably works quite well. You, you would agree with that. I'm, I'm, I'm sure Historic Environment Scotland, for our course today, uh, of course has a, a climate change plan. And, and I think people might, you know, on the outside be, be quite surprised to, to know that a body charged with caring for and promoting our environmental past has something very important to say about our future in this regard. Well, we passionately believe that our cultural heritage and our global cultural heritage has got a strong message to give people about climate change. And a having a sense of our past and who we are as a people, wherever we are on the planet, brings a, a resilience and a, a sense of community, a sense of awareness that we feel is very strong to take forward, to help us move forward and face the challenges of, of climate change. And the, the, um, the historic environment is a fantastic tool for engaging with people as well. And the number of people who visit sites, um, we're very fortunate in Scotland and, and my own organisation, we manage 345 all inspiring sites, um, spanning 5,000 years of time. And people are fascinated by that past and they engage and they want to know more information all the time. And the value of that in terms of what that brings to people um, and communities who have these monuments or buildings or castles, cathedrals, whatever they are, within, within, their, within, their, um, within their communities um, where, where they are, um, 
it gives people a sense of, of it's part of their DNA. It's part of our DNA. Mm -hmm. And it, it just it adds a strength and resilience that, that I think. How does it, uh, I'm sorry if this is just a daft question, but how does that help with climate change? I think the perspective of time is very important. Um, I think that um, a sense of who we are, where we've come from, is very important to take forward. Um, our place in time now is really crucial. Um, most of us don't think about that, we're, we're just sort of here and now, but in, in, in my job, um, um, I'm very aware that we are, we are stewards of our historic environment, and, and we're taking that forward. As, as John Ruskin was saying, then, he was saying it. Exactly that. And the, the historic environment is a record of human activity to this point, and what we are here to do is to secure the future going forward, and that, of course, has to embrace climate change. We, we have to address climate change um, to, to move forward. Mm -hmm. Now, what... I mean, you, you, you're all saying you're always a different way than you, you feel. We've got to talk. We've got to get the messaging out there. And, and that means meeting people sort of where they are. Can I introduce the, the, the sort of elephant in the room at the moment, which is, is coronavirus and, and, and the way in which that is, is uh, sort of seizing the agenda and seizing people's um, attention and fears and worries and so on. I just wonder how you, how you feel, Catherine, that that, that um, affects uh, you know, our, our ability, our headspace even, to think about, mm -hmm. to think about climate change and, and indeed where in the future it, it, it might take the debate. That's a very good question. As humans, we have limited capacity to worry about things, and today we are overwhelmed with this concern about this global pandemic. What it shows us is it shows us how intimately we are connected around the entire world. We are no longer islands in any sense of the word. We are all connected, and while climate change is not playing a role in spreading this disease, it is carried by humans. Climate change does affect infectious diseases that are carried by what we call vectors, and that means insects, ticks, rats, things whose geographic range is being broadened as climate changes. So climate change is affecting other diseases, but not coronavirus. That's an important action to make that yes. point because it is sometimes asked. Yes, people often ask that, yes. So, so climate change does not come in there, but on the other hand, we are seeing, for example, improvements in air quality, decreases in carbon emissions, people recognizing that not everything that we thought was absolutely essential, like flying everywhere, every other day of our lives, not everything is essential as we thought it was. What's really important to us is not necessarily the carbon that we burn or the money that we earn, it's the people we care about. So when it all comes down to it, that's what matters. And so that's why we care about climate change and that's why we care about coronavirus too. The fact that, that, that we are seeing um, very strong government action all, all yeah. across the world and uh, a, a population um, only too willing, really, in, in, in broad principle, to, to follow what the government says about yeah. their, their change of behaviour. What, what do you think about that? Do you see any, any parallels? Yeah, I think I do. Um, I mean, I think the time frames involved in these are uh, two issues that are quite important, um, given the coronavirus. Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting even just sitting here talking about this, I then was beginning to think about how, well, we don't quite know yet whether it's seasonal or not, yet climate change is changing when seasons happen. And that is something I hadn't even thought about until True. literally we were just talking about it. Um, but yeah, in terms of government response and people willing to, um, to change behaviour, I think, because we're talking about people changing behaviour here essentially, I think that um, we're at the very start of something that's very imminent and feels very imminent to people, but as this goes on, it will be interesting to see whether people are willing to, 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 to stay, say, isolated or whatever for a long period of time. And with climate, you know, I'm, I'm, so we're talking about maybe something over the course of, of months or probably a year here with coronavirus. With climate change, we're talking about, okay, it's impacting us now, but the sort of changes that we're trying to make are over the next decade, really, um, mm -hmm. especially by sort of 2030. And so I 
I think it's important, um, as we're seeing, with, we need clear communication on both of these things. We need clear communication from, from government on why it's good to do things, and the communication on climate change also needs to be very clear. It needs to be clear why we need to make certain types of changes and why they need to be made on the time scale that they need to be made. Um, and it's very much about, I think, bringing the public with you on this on this journey because people you're asking people to change their behaviour, but they don't need to understand why you're asking them to do that, why it's important to do that. And so again, all of this comes back to just really trying to be clear and trying to make good communication to people um, that they can understand. And that's a skill that is being asked a lot of, you know, Catherine's an incredible communicator, but most climate scientists are not. Because that's not what you're being trained to do. Exactly. People expect yeah. you to be able right. to do it as well right. for some reason. You go, that's a whole other thing. You know, you, you yeah. work very much in media and communication, yeah. but, but we need more people in these groups to work together, whether it's scientists and media, yeah. and everybody needs to work together to solve these problems. And, and it shouldn't be, oh, the scientist has to come on to tell us what to do, or it's, it's just about different types of uh, skill sets beginning to work Together on this, I'm quite lucky in that I, sorry, just one microphone, I uh, had been sort of doing performing at the same time as doing climate science, uh, climate science, and was just able to bring those two things together myself because I sort of had two skill sets. But you can't expect most people to have those skill sets. You need to have people with the different skill sets working together to solve the problems. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. across society, we need more people involved in, the, in solving climate change and. And we'll need more people involved in solving uh, the coronavirus issue. Yeah. But it is it is about it's, it's about changing behaviour, and and finding ways in which you convince people that it is worth changing the behaviour. It's worth the the sacrifice of what has been normality in the cause of a greater good. An, an awareness of our place on the planet, which mm -hmm. Catherine talked about right at the start of the presentation. And I think the climate change debate in the last 18 months or so has just moved on so, so much with um, the, the, David Attenborough, with, 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 with the Greta thing, and the school strikes, etc. And there's been, and plastic straws, etc. There's been a huge raising of awareness. And, I get the sense that has made us feel that the planet is a smaller place than we thought it yes. was. Or we are having a bigger impact mm -hmm. than we thought we were. Perhaps there's parallels there with what's happening with coronavirus because it's a global it's a global thing and we're having to take global action very quickly. So I think that, that's an interesting uh, parallel. But there's an increasing sense that we, we our impact on the planet is something we have to to face the consequences of and we have to deal with. We can't sweep it under the carpet any longer. And I think, the, I think there's a fundamental change there and an increasing awareness, and it's communicating that. Um, and then allowing people to take action on that. What can I do with that, yeah. which is the crucial thing. And, and do, you, do, you, do you think, any of you, that the fact that, that, that we, are, we are going to learn that, that um, this is what life is like when you can't walk into a plane, this is what life is like when you have to do stand up with a live audience. You know, lots and lots of things yeah. that you would think actually were kind of unthinkable. Yeah, 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 we're, yeah. we're kind of going to have to get used to them. When you come up the other side of that, that will have changed people's psyche. I would have thought in what from a um, and, and not to to underplay for one second the, the tragic consequences that, that, that will be as a result of this, but but it, it will have changed people's psyches in ways that, from a climate change point of view, may be considered positive. Would you say? So often um, we resist solutions because we haven't tried them, and when we don't try them, we feel like they're impossible. And so often we hear, for example, with climate change, we hear the solutions are so. Um, are so dramatic. So for example, you must immediately go vegan, stop all flying, have no children, no way to roll that back if you're already due, but, but the solutions presented to us as individuals are so dramatic that many people just feel like, well, I couldn't do that. But, for example, there was a survey recently conducted in the U.S. that found that 4% of the population is either vegetarian or vegan, 
but 94% of the population would be willing to eat more plants, more fruits and vegetables, 94%. So trying a meatless Monday, um, trying to telecommute. I've actually transitioned about 80% of my talks to virtual talks. And whenever I do travel, I bundle things so intensely that I'm usually doing multiple events every single day to minimize the carbon footprint per event, or I should say maximize, um, maximize the, the events per carbon footprint. Um, but even with these conversations we're talking about, with talking to people about climate change, people are often scared to just have that conversation. But they're scared because they think either we'll be butting heads or we'll just be so depressed about it. But if, if we kind of you know, figure out how, how would we start, what would we agree with them on, how could we connect the dots, the responses that I've heard from teachers who've gotten their kids to have conversations, from people who've gotten up their courage to talk to their grandmother or their friends or their, um, you know, their family, the response is almost always overwhelmingly positive. Like, why didn't I try this before? Why didn't I try a video presentation before? Why didn't I try you know, eating more fruits and vegetables before? Why didn't I try having a conversation about climate change before? So just the fact that we're trying these things, I think, can make a difference. Let me just take some of the, the questions that are coming in now. Um, and the, the, the one at the top here, um, mm -hmm. you know, how difficult is the balance between historic environment stewardship and environmental management stewardship? I was, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to jump in. I, it's one of that, it's one of those interesting questions that you see this happen quite a lot in the heritage world, where there is a sort of divide between the built environment and the natural environment, as if the two things are in separate mm -hmm. boxes. And of course, that's not really true. I mean, I, Past example I was thinking about earlier is things like Transtor Mall, which is a built environment practice, and it's a traditional built environment practice, but it's actually used as part of managing the landscape, as part of farming. And so, like all these things, if you take all the factors and you, you sort of consider it holistic in the right, it shouldn't be too difficult to find a balance, but you need to understand what's going on. So if you've got the right understanding of um, you know, the, the the pluses, the minuses, and the, the potential outcomes, then you can do it. And I think that's probably true of Strike of Arab Scotland and how you think about these things. Absolutely. And I, 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 I don't see there's any point in, in wrapping our castles up in, in isolation. I think they are part of society. They're, 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 as I said before, they're, they're, they're part of our, of our DNA, um, part of our communities. Um, and I, I just, I, I, I just don't see any 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 reason not not to think that that what we do with our historic environment and our heritage um, is any different to, to the way that, that we have to deal deal with climate change and anything else. And also, um, our cultural heritage is also things that are not tangible as well. So it's it's, it's historic practices, it's memories, it's stories, it's our music and our arts. Mm -hmm. And for me, everything is related. And we have to um, we have to capture all of those things in this discussion. Is it, is it uh, how, how difficult is it to to balance the, all sorts of things? I mean, I'm um, you know I'm the non-expert here in the panel, but I'm I'm aware that sometimes when we talk about these things. Um, a solution is presented, and then immediately you think, yes, but, you know, so that, you know, we all go, we all drive electric cars. What happens to all the millions and millions of petrol cars that we've got? What, you know, what kind of, you know, emissions does all that produce? That, that there is, um, that if people are thinking seriously yeah. about this, they, they come up with problems that then they go, oh, well, it's not Oh, yeah. it's too difficult. Yes, you know. Um, so, so that you know, where do you see the balance going going in all this? Do you do you? <laughs> all right, you thought about that. Yeah, no, yes. I mean, I, I completely agree. It's very it's very difficult to you get a lot of buts when you talk about climate change, yeah. <laughs> and some of them are incredibly well observed and, and relevant, mm -hmm. and some of them are things that are. <laughs> Um, and it can be hard to discern which ones are and which ones are. For instance, you often get is going, you know, is uh, driving an electric car. I've heard that that's not actually any better than driving uh, a petrol or a diesel car. 
It is. <laughs> <laughs> but then, but then your comments about well, okay, there are actual difficulties with that about infrastructure charging. Um, are things being thought about the storage? But then there's benefits of it because you might then have a battery in your car, which you can then power your home from. You know, and there, there's a huge myriad, myriad of things that are happening. It is very complex. And what I would say is, on most of the things that people have questions on, scientists are already working on those mm -hmm. and trying to find the answers. Is that call for expertise and the value of expertise? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I would say so. Yeah. Um, but that's not to say that lots of these questions aren't really great, valid questions that people should be at, should be asking. Um, but you know, if you ask one of those questions, it can be quite a complex answer on one of them, and there's a lot of questions that people have mm -hmm. on different solutions. Um, and people often look for the simple answers, but I would completely agree myself with Catherine's assessment that actually the biggest step that people can take is the first step. And, and you know, just cutting back on one thing or trying to make that first change is the main thing that you... Which, which is interesting, because there's a, there's a question here, how can I make a difference apart from turning my heating down a degree and flying less. Yeah. yeah. And you would presumably say, well, that is your start. That, you are... Yeah, well, yeah, I would say that's where to start. And then there's only, there is only a certain amount that we as individuals can do. We, we live in a very, I guess, quite an individualistic society where it's, we feel like everything's on us to, to solve. And there's only so much you can do as an individual. You can, you can try to turn down your heating, you can change your transport a bit, and you can maybe get solar panels, but I mean, you're making that decision once every, you know, five or ten years. And actually, then the next thing I think that you can do is to talk about it. And the other types of changes that need to happen that you can't make happen, how can you influence those decisions? Mm -hmm. So how can you, uh, you know, writing to politicians, um, protesting, talking to other people, having conversations about it. I have kept a track of how many people have changed their energy provider from coming to my shows. So I normally put it up at the end of um, the show and there's a referral code. And I've changed how many people have referred their energy, which is about, I don't know, 10 times the amount that I could ever do myself in an individual. There you year. go, um, yes. And so talk, you know, and that's just yeah. one example of yes. how talking about it has a positive impact on other people making decisions. But you, I think the thing to remember that is really important is that you only have a certain sphere of influence as an individual. You can only influence mm -hmm. certain people. So the answer, the questions you get are what I get is people saying, well, what about you know, China or India? And I mean, the first thing I then say is, well, the United States has more emissions than India and per person. <laughs> so it's very different. Um, but you can't worry about that. In life, in everything that you do, you can't worry about what's happening elsewhere, mm -hmm. you know? You, as but it's quite difficult to get people to make a sacrifice to say, I will, I will actually up my own discomfort. It is. In a teeny, teeny way in the scheme of yeah. things. But, um, but I think, I think there's, yeah. there's always something you can do. And, and we, I mean, managing the iconic properties that we do in, in, in Scotland is, is, and getting and changing in, in terms of climate change benefits is challenging. But we've discovered there's always something you can do. And if, if you're banging your head against the wall and you're not succeeding, just go in a different direction yeah. because you will yeah, still be able to do something. Mm -hmm. the, where we are tonight in Edinburgh Castle, we have reduced uh, carbon emissions um, in, in, this, in, the, in this monument um, by 40% in the last seven years. And at the same time, visitor numbers have nearly doubled. It's operating, it's one of the major tourist attractions in the United Kingdom. It doesn't have to be bad news. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be the end of everything. Mm -hmm. Which is so, fact, you, you, you may have uh, answered the, the question I was going to put to you from Andrew Potts, who's chair of the Climate Heritage Network, and he says, when using the care of shared heritage as a topic to bring people together, how useful is it to focus on loss and damage of heritage, or should we focus on being positive? I think it is important to uh, to be realistic about loss mm -hmm. and the threats, and there are situations where we will we will lose heritage. So coastal situations, particularly coastal erosion, sea level rise. 
But the key to that, again, is not to bury our head in the sand or run away from the problem. It's to say, well, if we are going to lose something, how do we manage that process? And how do we get the maximum benefit from that? So, for example, an archaeological site that's being eroded. Let's, keep, let's bring school kids in. Let's engage people with that. Let's excavate it and, and, and control and manage that process and, and obtain the, the, the maximum benefit we can from it. But it's also a way of helping people. If, if they recognise the loss, it helps people understand why it's more important to care for the stuff that's left as well. So it's, it's making that point that things are finite and therefore there is a reason to then take more care of what might be left so that we actually do focus our efforts where it's useful. But yeah, I think you're right that telling positive stories is really important. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, a, a whole bunch of organisations are working on, in fact, Andrew's Climate Heritage Network is, is one of those examples, is finding those stories, finding those examples, getting that message out much more. Because the more things that you can point to to say, here's a solution, here's an idea, here's, here's where it succeeded even better, then, then you can build confidence. It's about the, in the art of the possible, it's doable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Sharing those positive stories is so important. I would say, so I actually track the questions that I get. When I give talks, I usually use software that's built into my presentation and I collect the questions. And the last two years, the number one question that I've gotten from any type of audience across the UK, Canada, and the US is, you can probably guess, what gives you hope? That's the number one yeah. question. The number two question is, how do I talk to fill in the blank about climate change. But what gives you hope? I've turned that back on people and I've asked them. And I've gotten over 700 answers of what gives people hope. And what gives us hope is when we see other people acting in positive ways and we hear the stories of what the children are doing, what the companies are doing, what the people are doing, what unexpected actors are doing, like heritage sites. What people are doing, those good news stories, they give us hope and they make us feel like we can do something too, we're not alone, there is hope. I like that point about the unexpected actually. It's a bit like mm -hmm. the thing about comedy. It's that, oh, yeah. and you caught my attention there because that's a good Yeah, exactly. Ex exactly. It's, yes. it's finding those stories that you wouldn't have otherwise connected. Yes. And that's what makes us human, I think. We like, it intrigues us. And then you've got someone's interest and in you can talk to them. Question here, can the panelists make a comment on the value of artists being involved in climate change communications and changing behaviours? And I don't know if that's art artists in the in the painting sense or, or, or just oh, right. art, broadly. Yes. Broadly, yeah. Do you want to say? Oh well just to say you are <laughs> an artist yourself. Yes. <laughs> um, I would say it's so important because scientific facts and data don't touch our hearts, they don't touch our emotions. And we need to respond emotionally to this. And so we need art, whether it is comedy, whether it is visual art, whether it is the written word, that art touches a different place in our soul. And it connects us much more intimately. We bond, the psychological distance decreases, and ultimately, hopefully, it can inspire us as well. And what you guys are dealing with are the artists of the past, of course, yes. and, and, mm -hmm. and what they are communicating and you're helping them to communicate still. That's that point about culture and heritage not being separate things that mm -hmm. actually is yeah. part of that continuum. We have to tend to call the bits that happened in the past heritage yeah. and bits that are happening in the present culture, but it's right. still a false divine. Yeah. So yeah, mm -hmm. artists, craftspeople, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that scientists don't tell strange, well I think they do, but it is, it's, it's, it's yeah. narrative. Mm -hmm. Is the, the key thing? It's it conveying emotion. Mm -hmm. Those that's the core elements. I think you're right. Yeah. Well, there's two things. It's 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 whether it's getting the message across or uh, having got the message across, mm -hmm. uh, helping people to know what they can do. What what do you think is is stopping them right now? Well, I, I mean, there's a question there that says, you know, what about people who don't have the resources? You know, you can't afford an electric car. You can't make the choices that you want to. Uh, what about people who, it's just a case of putting the food on the table, making sure the children have clothes and shoes that don't have holes in them, um, you know, making sure that you have a safe place for your family to live, just the basic essentials of life. And I think that that's where the phrase that I used, a threat multiplier, that's where that comes in. Because the only reason we care about climate change is because it already affects everything we care about. That's the only reason why. 
I looked at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and those are very basic. Um, eliminating poverty and hunger, gender equality, education, safe place to live, healthy economy. And then you, you go down the list and there's climate action is number 13. And I actually feel like it shouldn't be a sustainable development goal at all. I would just take climate change out. And I would say the only reason we care about it is because of everything else, because of poverty, hunger, inequality, disease, lack of access to resources, political instability, refugee crises. The poorest and most vulnerable people in the world, whether right here in Scotland or in Africa or Southeast Asia, they are the ones who are suffering the most from the impacts of climate change. But you can get that across intellectually, and it can mm. be accepted intellectually. That's still not quite answering the question that you put yourself so very well there. What about if really what you have to think about is just get me on the table mm -hmm. and not where it comes from or whether it's plant-based or, right. you, you know? Well, that's, I think, where what, what Matt was saying comes in, is that um, we need system-wide change. Individually, we are not enough. So by all means, step on the carbon scale, look for a carbon footprint calculator, measure your carbon footprint, take sensible steps to reduce your own carbon footprint. But the most important thing we can do is advocate for system-wide change so that when someone is taking the bus, there is an electric bus for them to get on. So that when they are going to the grocery store, there is healthy food for them to purchase. That system-wide change is so important because when you look at it, 100 companies are responsible for 70% of emissions since the dawn of the industrial era. It is not an individual problem, but it is affecting individuals. And again, the poorest are bearing that cost. So system-wide change is essential so that people who just want to put food on the table have the ability to do so. Because as climate changes, their ability to do so is already decreasing. Climate change has increased the gap between the richest and poorest countries by 25% already. And since the 1980s, we've been losing $5 billion worth a year in crop losses due to climate change, much of that in poor and developing countries. And I, and I think that's where the communication aspect is really important because we're maybe not asking most people to change, but you need to have effective communication on why, not that they should change, but why system change needs to happen because it will help benefit them. And that comes back to better communication and making things. You know, I talk to lots of people in media and TV and stuff, and I say the most important thing that can be done right now is making stuff to help people understand this and help, to help people understand why it's important in their lives. There's a question, these are very good questions coming in. The government's pledged to build thousands of new houses. Is this a positive or a negative? Is there a point to be made about the reuse and repurpose of existing buildings? Right. And <laughs> <laughs> yes. Come on, a few apartments in here. Are they repurposing the hospital? I think. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, resource efficiency, the time has come. We have to look much more carefully at what, what we're doing in terms of extracting resources from our planet. The reuse and recycling of buildings is as valid as recycling a piece of paper or, 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 or a cup. Yeah. So, and yet we're all stuck, not all of us in Scotland, but a lot of us in Scotland are stuck with these old buildings that can't be insulated. Uh, well, can't you know, know, it's another it. problem. Me too. Well, they can't can, can, can be insulated. Yeah. Uh, uh, so like, my yeah. comments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, well, we, part of the reason we for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. Part of the reason for us. Um, uh, reducing carbon on, on, on a building like Edinburgh Castle is to demonstrate the art of the possible. So if we can do it here, at how much it costs? Economy, it cost a lot, but it paid for itself within five years. So what's not to like about reducing your energy bills? So the, the advantages of doing it are, 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 are there. It's so, back to communication again. So there's lots of mm -hmm. people have done lots of good things in this sphere. Strong Farm in Scotland, you know, Loads of people are working on this business of how do you make buildings perform better. But probably what we're not doing enough of is telling people when it worked mm -hmm. and saying you too can do this. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's the gap between the examples that exist and widespread understanding and that's what's possible. The benefits of those are bringing to you. So if you haven't heard about insulating your house, I think that's our fault, Ian. I think we're going to have to admit that. I suppose, it, yes. I mean, I know it can be done, but um, the, well, this is really interesting. The thought of it is appalling. 
<laughs> of what would be involved and how much it would cost. And and, ask you and the cost, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, every what every wall has got to be stripped back. Well, people don't like change. Again, yeah. but, and that's it. but again, you, you you can't do everything, but there's always something you can do, mm -hmm. and, that, and, that, and, that, and that and that brings you forward. And there's there's the simple stuff that I guess some people don't. Maybe maybe not enough people know. You, we have a tradition, a heritage of having very heavy curtains in our houses in Scotland. And that's part of insulation, that's about reducing the energy loss. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the simple things that actually we used to do that you were thinking about, that stuff works pretty well. I think looking back and learning. Very sorry, I finished. <laughs> 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 I think we can learn from our heritage because many, many of our older buildings, our historic buildings, they were built at a time before hydrocarbon, before electricity, before air conditioning, mm -hmm. yeah. before gas. Yeah. And they were they are inherently passive, they are inherently mm -hmm. efficient, thermally efficient, mass masonry walls, south facing mm -hmm. facades with large windows to get solar gain and thermal gain. Um, and and part of the way of, 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 of future proofing was building and taking them forward is actually to look to the past. Yeah. Um, and understand how they were designed because they were cleverly designed, they were well built, they're survivors, they're still with us. They have a resilience um, and, and an inherent quality that we need to understand. And part of the problem, I think, is that we, we tend to look through the lens of, of, of modern construction. How do we fix it with, a, mm -hmm. with, a, with air conditioning? How do we fix it with, with, a, with, with, with some um, mechanical system? And actually, it's kind of unwinding it, and that—that's mm -hmm. the point about learning from the past. I think comes in very strong. And, and if I could just add to that, so I live in a part of the world where you need air conditioning. If you do not have air conditioning in the summer, it is a medical emergency. <laughs> but if you go to, we have a ranch and heritage center. It's one of those places where they took historic buildings and they assembled them in a village. And back before the days of air conditioning and hydrocarbons they built very thick adobe walls in that part of the world. The walls were very thick, they were made out of mud and straw, and when you walk into an adobe home in the middle of the summer, it could be 35 degrees or more out, inside that home it's 20 degrees, because it, it maintains the coolness of the night. And so they knew how to build and how to live in that time, and we've replaced that with construction that is not resilient to the climate in which it stands. So we do have a great deal to learn from the past. And I think, um, Sarah mentioned, uh, sorry, mentioned craft, craft skills and indigenous practices and we talked about managing buildings in historic environments versus the wider natural environment. A lot of indigenous practices, agricultural practices, were very sustainable and I think we can learn from that today and how, how did we manage land in the past mm -hmm. in ways that, 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 that were sustainable and, and didn't damage it. Um, and I think learning from the past again is a really important message. Whoever asked, asked that question, that was a very good <laughs> question. We are moving towards the, towards the end now. I'd like to ask you what uh, you know. What one tip, perhaps, you would, you would uh, leave us with for, for inspiring the kind of change that we want to see? One tip each. Oh well, I, I think that the tip is actually in in these questions that we have. One question says. Um, how do we use cultural heritage to help spread the message about climate change? I think the tip is to find out where we can connect with someone. And again, it would have nothing to do with climate change per se, but we might both be fans of the same football club, or we both have a passion for historical buildings, or we really enjoy um, you know, travel to certain types of places, or we're from the same place, or we enjoy certain pastimes. The key to changing the system is to show that, again, what unites us is more than what divides us. And we all, in the end, want the same thing. We want a safe place to live with clean air to breathe, clean water to drink, enough food to eat, a healthy economy, a home for our children. We all want those things. And so by connecting climate change to the issues we most care about, we realize that we are already the perfect person to care. Any more tips? I'm going to change yeah. tack and I'm going to say, <laughs> If you're someone working for a small heritage organization like me, and it's picking up on the communication point, put climate on your agenda. Put it on the papers, the news things, start the conversation, and if you start the conversation, stuff will happen. Yeah. And I would say, don't be afraid to challenge. 
be a challenger. So if, if someone's leaving the lights on, just question them. If someone opens at my pet hate, if someone opens a window and the radiators are still turned on, challenge that and turn, get them to turn the radiators down. And go for a meat-free Monday. My children are telling me meat-free Monday, that's what we get at school, and a waste-free Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So do it, go, go with it, and don't, don't be afraid to challenge, because we, we accept norms, and pe people are nervous about change, but we need to question some of our norms mm -hmm. and control them. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with all these. Yeah, do, do stuff, that would be my main thing. Do things, yeah. and doing nothing isn't going to achieve anything, so get out and try and do things, whatever it is. Yeah. And last question of all, and I'll just ask it to you, uh, Catherine. Hope, mm -hmm. what makes you hopeful? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I can say what makes me not hopeful. Number one, the science makes me not hopeful. Um, every new study, <laughs> Matt just took a deep breath when I said that. Every new study we read seems like it's worse than we thought, or it's to a greater extent than we thought, or faster than we thought. Yeah. And frankly, the politics does not give us a lot of hope either. Yeah. If we place our faith in, faith in the politics, we will always be disappointed. But where I find the hope is looking at what people are doing. Whether it is individual people taking small actions, whether it is large groups of people as part of a community, as part of a city, as part of a company, as part of a church, large groups of people taking action, recognizing again that we are not the only ones with our hands on that giant boulder. And we're not trying to roll it uphill anymore. It's starting to roll downhill very slowly. So just recognizing that we are not alone and through that, finding that hope to act, because when we act, that gives us hope, the act of acting. So often, people are, are very depressed, anxious, even panicked about climate change. And that fear makes us retreat. It makes us pull back. It makes us almost paralyzed. But if we decide, if we choose, that even though I feel panicked about this, I'm going to go out and have a conversation with somebody about it. I'm gonna look for some good news that I could share. I'm gonna take part in something positive like a tree planting project in my community. Or I'm going to go to the organization I'm part of and encourage them to do something sustainable in their practices. If I make a choice to do that, it will in turn affect how I feel about it. Great. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. That's a, a great note to end on. Thank you for your contribution, Matt, Sarah, and Ewan, thank you very much to you for all your great questions from us this evening. Bye. <laughs>